join me all weekend right here on YouTube where we will live stream all four games from the USFL. And now, on with our feature presentation. Bud Graham, one of the greatest head coaches in the history of the NFL. In his 18 seasons as the head coach in the Minnesota Vikings, he made it to the Super Bowl four times and brought the Vikings to relevancy after they were consistently one of the lesser quality teams in the NFL under their previous head coach, Norm Van Brocklin. He made the playoffs 12 times at a time where only around 30% of the teams made the playoffs in any given year. He won well over 62% of his games and had a stretch where he won the NFC Central 10 times in 11 years, to the point where you could know absolutely nothing about football, and yet, you could confidently bet on the Vikings to win the division, and pencil them in without a shadow of a doubt. And this isn't even including his time in the CFL with the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, where he won over 100 games there, won four Grey Cups, and made it to six, making the Grey Cup more than half of his seasons with the team. If you want to learn more about just how great Bud Grant was, you can do so by clicking the card in the upper right corner. Dick Vermeil, also one of the greatest head coaches in the history of the NFL, winning everywhere he went. After the Philadelphia Eagles were the laughing stock of football throughout the first half of the 1970s, he rebuilt them and turned them into a formidable opponent, guiding them to the playoffs four straight years and even guiding them to their first Super Bowl in franchise history, when they made it to Super Bowl XV against the Oakland Raiders. Then, he came out of retirement a decade and a half later to take over the St. Louis Rams. And against all odds, he turned a team that was the worst team in the 1990s prior to his arrival and made them Super Bowl champions during the 1999 season with a backup quarterback, guiding them to their first Super Bowl title in franchise history. And then, he coached four seasons in Kansas City, and won over 55% of the time there, finishing with just one losing record. Both Dick Vermeil and Bud Grant are in the Pro Football Hall of Fame, and rightfully so. Both men have made it to multiple Super Bowls, and are widely respected for how good they were in their profession. Both men are respected for making the transition from their previous level of football, whether it was the CFL or college, to the NFL, and making it quite seamless. But what you might not know, is that even though the two men were great coaches, there was a massive controversy between the two men during the 1980 season. Because in week two, when the Minnesota Vikings played the Philadelphia Eagles, head coach Dick Vermeil apparently did something that was so classless that Bud Grant, who's usually not one to call out people in press conferences, decided to attack his coaching philosophy, having a major problem with it. And whether you're on Vermeule's side with this, or Grant's side by the end of this, well, that's up for you to decide. Because this is the story behind the bizarre drama between Hall of Fame head coach Bud Grant and Hall of Fame head coach Dick Vermeule. Before I talk about the actual incident in question and the comments made by both men, we need some context to understand how the game was going, because the game itself was what sparked this feud between the two. It's September 14th, 1980. It's week two of a brand new season, and we've got an NFC battle on our hands at Metropolitan Stadium up in Minnesota between the Minnesota Vikings and the Philadelphia Eagles. Both the Vikings and Eagles are off to great starts in the new year, with the Eagles sitting at 1-0 following a convincing 27-6 victory at the hands of the Denver Broncos, and the Vikings sitting at 1-0, following a come-from-behind victory against the Atlanta Falcons. And I think it goes without saying, but if you start the season 2-0, and start the season with two wins in your first two games, you put yourself in a really good position going forward. For some perspective, in 1979, 10 teams made it to the playoffs. There were 8 teams that started the season 2-0, and of those 8, six of them made the playoffs, or 75%. Conversely, there were 12 teams to start 1-1, one and, one, and just four of them made the playoffs, or 33%. You can see the difference between a 2-0 start and a 1-1 one and one start in making the playoffs and playing January football. It was a pretty big deal. 
So both of these teams were absolutely looking for a win here. However, as you can probably tell from these highlights, this scheme went one way and one way only. And that way was in favor of the Philadelphia Eagles. Because to say that they dominated this one would be an understatement. As they gave Bud Grant the worst loss of his NFL career at the time. When all was said and done, not only did the Eagles emerge from this one victorious, despite the fact that they were going on the road and were four-point underdogs, but they did so by a final score of 42-7. to You want to talk about total domination? This scheme was the textbook definition of that. The Eagles had no trouble throwing the ball all over the field, as they finished the day going 21-27, for completing over 77% of their passes for a combined passer rating of 119.1 which was astronomically high for a game in 1980. The Eagles had no trouble running the ball all over the field, as not only did they find the end zone four times on the ground, and not only did they run for 249 yards and over 6.2 yards per carry, but their star running back, Wilbert Montgomery, had 169 yards on 8.5 yards per carry. So he was feeling it and was having arguably the best game of his entire career. In total, Philadelphia had 529 yards of total offense, compared to just 207 for the Vikings, with Philly outgaining the Vikings by around 250%. Philadelphia forced a ton of pressure with their pass rush, as the Vikings quarterbacks got sacked three times and got hit a couple of times. At the same time, the Eagles kept a clean pocket the entire game, with no one taking a sack. Ron Jaworski, the starting quarterback, barely had any dirt or mud on his shoulder by the end of it. That's how little he was touched. Philadelphia's defense played lights out as well, as you can probably expect when a team scores just 7 points. Tommy Kramer started the game under center for the Vikings, and he was atrocious on this day, going 16 for 39, completing only 41% of his passes, and throwing an interception in the red zone that really turned the entire game on its head. And Philly's run defense was magnificent, holding the Vikings to just 32 rushing yards on 2.2 yards per carry. Granted, the Vikings were not really great at running the football in general that season, as they ended the year fourth from the bottom in rushing yards and second from the bottom in yards per carry. But still, this was an extremely impressive outing by Philly. There aren't really too many flaws that you can pick from this game if you're an Eagles fan. This was a beatdown, and a surprising beatdown at that, and was maybe the best that the Eagles ever looked in a game at the time in the post-merger era. Dick Vermeil had his team ready to play, and that is an understatement. So what's the controversy? Well, like I said, this game was a beatdown. But in the eyes of Bud Grant, it was too much of a beatdown. Entering the fourth quarter, the Eagles were up 28-7, and were leading by three possessions. You would think that this should be the time that Philly would take their foot off the gas and start playing more conservatively, running the ball and just trying to drain the clock. Maybe they even put in the backups. However, they did not do that. Instead, Ron Jaworski threw a 45-yard touchdown pass on a fly route to Scott Fitzke to give the Eagles a 35-7 lead. Alright, maybe that's not a huge deal teams can come back from a 21-point deficit. But now, it was a 28-point lead for the Eagles midway through the fourth quarter. This game was over. Maybe now you can go conservative and put in the backups and just run out the clock. However, once again, they did not do that. Instead, Ron Jaworski was not only still in the game, but was throwing passes and not only threw a fly route to Harold Carmichael that went for a gain of 26, but later in that drive, threw a touchdown pass to Harold Carmichael to make it 42-7. Alright, now it's a 35-point game late in the fourth. Obviously, the game is over by this point. I know it ain't over until the fat lady sings, but every single woman in the state of Minnesota was singing by this point. And statistically speaking, at least one of them had to be overweight. Reasonably speaking, you can call off the hounds and not throw the ball 
or call any chunk plays. And to be fair to Vermeil, he finally took out Ron Jaworski and some of his starters by this point, as in a 5 possession game, there was no real reason to leave them out there. But that didn't stop Vermeil and the Eagles from keeping their foot on the gas. Mainly, one play where Charlie Smith caught a 46-yard pass on a fly route to keep the drive alive with 5 minutes left in the contest. The Eagles left their starters in until it got to a 42-7 score. And then, once it got to that score, they were still throwing the ball and trying to pick up big yards on plays. And to say that this made Bud Grant livid would be putting it lightly. Because after the game, let's just say that he was furious with Dick Vermeil for his coaching and for keeping his foot on the gas. After the game, Grant took a shot at Vermeil and said, Everybody tries to work on their statistics. Dick Vermeil's got a little college background in him. You want to run up the score for the ratings, but we don't have ratings in this league. In other words, remember that Vermeil, prior to becoming the head coach of the Eagles, was the head coach at UCLA, and especially when it came to the AP rankings and all of the other rankings from publications during a time where you had to box score watch instead of actually watch the games on TV, because very rarely were even the best teams on television, you had to run up the score and make the game look as ugly as possible. You had to make it look convincing. But in the NFL, obviously, that doesn't matter a whole lot. Whether you win a game by 7 points or 70 points, it counts exactly the same unless you get super deep into the tiebreaker system. So in grand size, it was clear. Vermeil was trying to run up the score on us, and he was extremely classless for doing so. Grant, from all accounts, sounded livid while saying this too, and was fuming at Vermeil and the Eagles for continuing to pour it on when the game in his eyes was well out of reach. And understandably, the Eagles took offense to this big time, saying that they weren't trying to run up the score on them, and that at the end of the day, this is a professional football team. There is no such thing as running up the score. So long as points scored and point differential means something in the tiebreaker system, no matter how high or low on the rung it is, you have to play the whole 60 minutes and keep your foot on the gas. So long as players are getting paid to play, and play well, you're going to try," said starting quarterback Ron Jaworski, who played about 53 minutes of this bloodbath. Vermeil is trying to develop a killer instinct on this football team. The idea is to get tougher and put people away. We weren't trying to embarrass them. Remember what happened two years ago, with that last part referring to their 1978 contest in Week 14, when the Eagles led 27-14 at the half, and lost the game 28-27 after getting outscored 14-0 in the second half. Granted, it's very different, because a 27-14 game at the half, and a 27-21 game at the end of three quarters, is very much up in the air, while a game that's 42-7 with five minutes to go, is very much not up in the air. But you get where Jaworski is coming from. Vermeule commented on his position as well, saying, I didn't intend to score 42 points against Minnesota. We didn't try to rump the score on Coach Bud Grant. Some of those short route passes went for touchdowns. You can't stop the guys from playing when the score mounts. Translation, It's not my fault you guys stunk that day. It's not my fault that our team came to play. I'm not going to tell them to stop. Granted, I wouldn't exactly call what Vermeule was calling short route passes, seeing as they were typical fly routes. It's not as though he was calling slants and screens, and then the guy broke a tackle. The man flat out called a 46-yard bomb with 5 minutes left up 42-7, so calling those short passes is just a slight mischaracterization of the situation. If the bomb is a short pass, I hate to see what an actual short pass is. However, the point still stands. We're going to play for all 60 minutes. That's Eagles football. And if you can't stop us, too bad. Because we're not going to tell our guys to lie down. As a side note, 
to learn more about another bizarre controversy involving the Philadelphia Eagles during that 1980 season in a much closer game, you can do so by clicking the card in the upper right corner. And for what it's worth, the Eagles and Vikings would meet again, as the two teams played each other in the divisional round, with the Eagles winning that one 31-16 in one of the sloppiest playoff games of all time, with 11 turnovers and seemingly every second half drive resulting in a turnover. The Vikings couldn't get their revenge, but at least that one wasn't a bloodbath like this one, I suppose. Which raises the question. In the September early season battle between two highly respected coaches, whose side are you on? Are you on the side of Bud Grant, who pulled his starters and was punting in the fourth quarter with the game out of reach, and thought that Dick Vermeil should have accepted his waving of the white flag and not called passing plays? Are you on the side of Dick Vermeil, who had his team play the same way all 60 minutes, and had his starters go deep into the fourth quarter of a five possession game? Whoever side you're on is up to you. But one thing is clear. On this day in 1980, in the eyes of Bud Grant, Dick Vermeil was being kind of a, well, you can fill in the blank. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jj9shop.com and be sure to like and subscribe as it really helps the channel out a lot. Join me every Wednesday night where we'll play NFL trivia for cash prizes at 9 p.m. Eastern over on Twitch. To learn more about the history of college football, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To learn more about the history of Major League Baseball, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 7. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.